So when we conceptualized the idea of doing these vodcasts, I kind of really didn't want to talk to any winemakers, um, mainly because we've kind of already done that already when we first started this whole show. You can go back through all the live streams and see where we spoke to, I think, over 100 different winemakers. Um, and not that winemakers don't have a lot to offer. Uh, I'm just really interested and fascinated uh, to talk to and, and share the conversations with people outside of that winemaking sphere, outside of the, the production sphere. Like I said, people that get me excited about wine. Winemakers certainly do that, but there are a raft of other people that we rarely hear from. That said, there are a handful of winemakers that uh, have either been requested uh, on the channel saying that you know we should definitely get in touch with them. Um, but also people that I really truly admire in the industry and um, one of those people is Peter Dredge. Um, you guys might know his alter ego in winemaking, Dr. Edge, uh, or Dredgy as we know him. Uh, and I've known Peter for the better part of a decade, not in a very familiar sense, just the fact that we're both Aussie winemakers. Uh, we both sort of, um, he, he was maybe a little bit before my time when he started, but uh, we've both sort of grown our own businesses together. And in, we've, we've judged wine shows. Uh, uh, it's like a bit of a circuit thing uh, where people judge sort of various wine shows uh, across Australia and we've sort of touched base um, a little bit through that. Um, but we've always been friendly and, you know, quasi-familiar but never really got uh, to sit down with him for any amount of time without distractions, without all the egos in the room uh, and just have a conversation about him and what motivates him, uh, how he uh, came to be what I believe and we all sort of vehemently believe on the show is one of Australia's best winemakers, hands down. And we've proven it time and time again in blind tastings where we don't know the brands and we don't know the prices. We have no idea what wines are being thrown at us. And again and again and again, Dredgy's Wines in the form of Dr. Edge or Meadowbank or any of the other projects that he's involved in uh, keep coming up trumps um, for you know, Wine of the Week uh, multiple times. Um, you'll get a bit of an insight yeah, into how he became a winemaker, what motivates him, uh, what's, what inspires him. Uh, and what might potentially be on the horizon. And you'll probably end up learning a whole bunch of stuff about him that you probably didn't realize, like uh, running uh, an amazing cooperative winery uh, in Tasmania, as well as some of the other projects he's involved in. I took a lot away from this conversation, mainly because uh, Dredgy for me has always been quite an introverted person. I'm a very extroverted person. Uh, and I didn't actually expect Dredgy to talk so much, which is great. It's absolutely awesome uh, to interview a guest like this who is so uh, generous uh, with their knowledge uh, and also just really exceptionally humble uh, about their background. I think he spends more time thanking other people than he does sort of taking, um, uh, claiming his own rights to, to being absolutely awesome. But anyway, you guys will have your own opinions about him. I absolutely love the man. I hope you guys do too. Enjoy the chat. Gorgeous numbers. Like, like high 10 Bome, like 8 TA, uh, 3.1 pH. Beautiful. DRC, utilised second crop, so there's no reason you shouldn't, <laughs> mate. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, great, the great terroir of the Northern Adelaide Hills Fiano. That's right. Um, but I mean, look, addressing the obvious, like there's not so much an elephant in the room as it is just, it's so obvious to, to everyone. You are the most liked, loved, appreciated winemaker. Uh, and we've been oh, doing this for like fuck, four yeah. years now. Mate, it's nuts. It's absolutely bonkers. And it really came to a head uh, a couple of weeks ago when we did it. Because all the tastings are 100% blind. We don't even know mm. what wines have been purchased. Like the, the invoice goes to Laura, the wines go to Lockie, the videographer. Um, and then they can they can sit anywhere up to like six weeks, so we don't even see it till they're in a in a glass in front of us. And the fact that we tasted this this Chardonnay, that to be honest was like it was good, but it wasn't great. It was it was it was well made, but it was boring as batshit. Mm. And independently, all three of us are going, yeah, this is fine, but it's boring. And then it's literally your wine which were like oh wow that's really sort of off base because he's you like usually we're blown away with your wines you've been one of the week for, for uh you know multiple tastings that we've done before and and we didn't even know the ennui so i've never heard of that saying before none of us have and so we had no context oh you feel like and only on the instagram with... <laughs> <laughs> it was so good though it was so good because the comments from from uh on the youtube um uh channel 
people were literally describing to us saying, hey, um, ennui literally means boring. I was like, wow, this guy's so good that he can actually make a wine that's boring and get blind tasted as being boring. How how do you wins. Yeah, that's I've it. just got so many questions. Like like how how do you end up being a winemaker that's that good? Is it intuition or are you learning it? And like where did you learn this? It, do you even regard yourself as being talented? I just I'm I'm exploding with questions. Oh my god. I don't know where I start. Um now the first rule of media presentation training, Brendan, is to get the questions in advance. So I've practiced a little bit, but I guess we start. Good. Um, oh, we start with, and I guess this will, if we prattle on for a while, um, one of your questions first was, was working in wine always on the cards for you, a childhood pipe dream, or seems like a good idea at the time type scenario? And that's pretty, we can pretty much just go from there. So I never wanted to be a winemaker. I wasn't part of a, a multi-generational winemaking family. Um, I grew up in Adelaide, Foothills, Adelaide Hills, and I was a jock and a sporto and had a fondness for science, and I wanted to be a physiotherapist and also play sports, whether it was amateur league or semi-professional or professional, I wasn't quite sure. Um, that was the pipe dream at about 15, and then when I turned 17, I had a, a major unfortunate head injury at high school. I um, you may have heard this, some people may have, some people haven't, but I caught a discus in the head, um, a ride discus, which shouldn't have been thrown, and it was a complete accident, but I lost the hearing in my left ear. Um, I spent much of my final year of high school in rehabilitation, um, just trying to get some semblance of normalcy back after losing hearing, losing balance, um, having a lot of trouble studying off whiteboards and all those sorts of things. And to me, at the time, my career was dashed and I had this air of hopelessness and I got my way through year 12 over two years. Um, I didn't quite get into physiotherapy because my studies were impeded. I got into exercise and sports science up at Flinders, but it just felt a bit empty and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So enter, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, my sister um, was friends with Brian Crozer of the Adelaide Hills um, daughter and he'd sort of bumped into my mum somewhere and said, how's Pete going? And mum was sort of, you know, he's a bit down and out with the injury and loss of balance and his sporting career is pretty much down the gurgle and he's not sure what to do. And he'd sort of said, is he good at science? And my older sister is a very accomplished scientist and he said, I'll just chuck him in the lab up at Petaluma um, if he wants some work. By this stage, I was in a bit of a gap year from the transition to university to see what it is that I wanted to do outside of sports and sports science, and I ended up in a lab at Petaluma. Knew the lab work, met some pretty inspiring characters there at Petaluma, and it had been pointed out to me, this is, we're talking 1997 here, so a long time ago, and it was pointed out to me that the first two years of school or university in Adelaide um, for physio and also agricultural science where Brian Crozer was slowly drawing me towards was exactly the same. So I figured I'll, I'll start ag science. I'll see how this winemaking thing goes. And if I don't like it after two years, I'll attempt to um, pull my degree over. So by this stage, I worked vintage 98 in the Adelaide Hills, which was a cracking vintage, um, you know, just scrubbing floors, doing lab work, doing this sort of stuff. And then Slowly but surely worked their part-time work down at Adelaide Uni, did the winemaking degree and the rest, as they say, it's history. But really, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry, Brendan. But um, at the time, I I must admit, we never talked about mental health and these sorts of things in the 90s. It would be tough. So, But upon reflection, I was in a pretty dark place and very lost and I was a teenager and I didn't know what to do. And winemaking or a sense of purpose at the winery turned into um, a goal. And I always felt it was a privilege to have a job there. And I felt it was an opportunity, as pointed out to me by parents and sisters and people who knew me well because I'd hit a bit of a slump. And I took it as an opportunity and I listened and worked hard. And admittedly, I 
I finished off uni in O2, but have had a very fortunate, um, incredible career, which I feel is probably forged by being a little bit depressed and then coming out of a slump and seeing the whole thing as um, not a chore, but a, a privilege as far as work and winemaking and these sorts of things go. So Bride Crows was an incredible winemaker. He's, a, he's an incredible winemaker, an incredible inspiration. And he had a very, he was very technically astute. And then throughout the course of my career, I started, um, you know, mixing with people like Mike Benny up at uh, um, Evans Tutorial. And then, you know, the antithesis of crystal clean and clear wines from Petaluma. Mike Benny was sort of waving the flag on pretty oxidative Jura styles and trying to import them um, with various other importers and stuff. So, yeah, um, I had a, let's just say, a very classical upbringing, very technical upbringing. And then slowly over the course of the last 20 years have done enough travel and been to enough wineries and worked in enough places to realise that no one's right or wrong. People make choices on how they make their wines. And yeah, we need not judge people based on their styles. And I I would say in a nutshell, I've just taken snippets of what I've seen and what I've learned. And again, tried to remain humble enough to respect people's decisions in how they make wine and then just take little snippets as I go. And I think I've sort of started to patch together 20 years worth of um, listening into the Dr. Edge wines that you sort of, see today where would you say you're drawing the greatest okay. amount of your inspiration uh it would have been there again it was um it was at petaluma we were the sole focus there oh, sorry my mom dodgy can you still hear me yeah mate yeah so Greatest imp- inspiration at the time was, yeah, late 90s. And Cruiser had forged a reputation on single vineyard um, sites and sub-regionality in South Australia. So we were looking at Clare Valley Riesling, Coonawarra, um, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, uh, Adelaide Hills Chardonnay, Adelaide Hills Sparkling, and he'd basically broken it down with growers and leases to uh, make site they used to call it typicity and sense of place um, were paramount. So I had a huge amount of inspiration from him, from a technical aspect. Um, his leading man at the title, Konstantinos Moshos, kind of Moshos was leading the charge and he was running day to day and dealing with, again, upon reflection, dealing with a kid who'd come in from nowhere and was probably 17, 18, head up his ass, you know, young. And um, he sort of taught me that there's a lot of wankers, and I quote from about 98, there's a lot of wankers in the wine industry, so you just got to make sure you don't sort of get engulfed in it too much. So I drew a lot of inspiration from him on work ethic and also tempering, I guess, the sort of lofty reputation of Petaluma at the time. Um, Anna Martins was also running day to day. Um, Have you come across Anna Martins in your time? She's doing a bit of it. Absolutely. Stuff. She's doing amazing things over on Etna. Very weak yeah. down that very nat- hardcore natural path, of course, uh, and also runs one of the Le Cave de Peren, one of the best importers uh, of wines of that ilk, certainly in the UK. Incredible. Yeah, brilliant. And brilliant person, brilliant temperament, and I'll be forever grateful for her advice and her patience with me because... You know, there were days where I wanted to leave within six months of being there. And had I done that, you know, the sliding door would have taken me Mm. somewhere else. So we had those guys um, in the early days uh, thinking on. I I was a judge and it was the AWBC's export approval tasting panel. Do you you ever remember that thing? Wow, yeah. Very archaic days. Archaic days of deciding at... I don't know, the ripe old age of 22 with a lady called Sue Bell of Bellwether in the Coonawarra would sit there and decide people's fate and whether they could export wines based on uh, vinosity and all these sorts of things. And we sort of used to sit there and we wouldn't reject anything. We didn't want to ruin with, you know, ruin people's livelihoods. And 
yeah, they, <clears throat> you know, this was on the cusp of the natural wine movement as well. There was a wine list up in Sydney that had curated, rejected wines that weren't in theory allowed to be exported out of Australia. But um, I'm prattling on again, but Sue Bell certainly taught me a lot about humility um, in the industry as well. Um, she is an incredibly talented winemaker as well and makes beautiful wines and um, is very passionate about her region, the Kunawara, which I was um, very uh, passionate about when I worked at Petaluma. And it's a region that has come in and out of favour both by locale or champion variety of the area. And uh, it's inspiring to watch her um, make wines and things of beauty over a long-term period out of the Kunawara. But anyone who knows her, she's such a lovely person that she'll She'll put me in my place um, pretty quickly when I'd started Dr. Edge and a few, you know, a few gongs came with um, Bay of Fires as well, a few trophies and stuff. She goes, oh, you're such a fucking rock star. Just, you know, put your, take your hand off it and all these sorts of things. So she taught me how to, um, yeah, not get too carried away, as did my three older sisters as well. But um, it's most certainly her. Um, Mike Benny, I mentioned in that he opened me up to a lot of styles of the world um, and not sort of uh, pigeonholing yourself into Australian styles. Um, the list goes on. When you've been rabbiting around for 20 years working harvests in um, Germany and spending a lot of time in Hungary and France and Italy and Oregon in the United States, um, the inspiration or well, the people that inspire you, the list just grows and grows and grows. I mean, John Carter, you would have met in your time as well. He was one of my judges at Hot 100 South Australian Wines because he liked wine, but he was an anthropologist. And I'd consider him one of the, the inspiring figures in my winemaking career as well in that, you know, teaching me to love things on the dinner table, whether it's food or the other humans or, you know, um, the community that you're in rather than just slapping a bottle of wine on the table like the grandiose winemakers of old used to do and it all became about the wine. You wouldn't talk about anything else. Hey, kids are, how's school, how's study? It's like, oh, no, I reckon that's a bit oaky, that Chardonnay, and then they'd dominate the dinner party. Boring. <laughs> so, yeah, there's him. And then, yeah, as, as we head on, I moved from Petaluma to Tasmania, and Ed Carr and Sparkling, Paul Lapsley, Tom Newton, my bosses were at the time, um, were incredibly inspiring in how technically astute they were. Viticulturalist Ray Guerin, amongst others, Mike Carnes, who I worked with, viticulturalists and growers around Tasmania. The list goes on and on and on. And some of the guys over in, in Oregon who I was lucky enough to work with as well. It's how long's a piece of strength? You what yourself, do you of- we do we do case swaps. We get I oh, get some of your weird and wonderfuls over at the winery as well, and I watch you dart you and Laura darting around, and you know it's pretty inspiring. Can't sit still. No, not really, not really. We tried do it. We tried sitting still for a little while, and we found it really uncomfortable. Um, but I, I'm curious because uh, I'm actually um, fortunate enough to be chatting to Brian Crozer next week. Um, <laughs> uh, we're having a bit of a, a bit of a sit down. Uh, and discussion he's one of my greatest sort of idols um, you know believe it or not I once sat I once sat behind him on a plane and still kicking myself to this day I could have said g'day to him but I was so terrified of stuffing it up um, I was more terrified to say g'day to Brian than I was saying g'day to my own wife when I first met her um, <laughs> he's for me the guy like that came up with the homoclime model that really sort of built out this thing with with Peter Dry and Richard Smart um, uh, and um, really is the crux of everything we do at Unico, you know, comes from this this one idea that he sort of fleshed out. What's your take on his, you know, he's really taking it to a whole new level with Flurio Pino. Mm-hmm. You think the great terroir of the Flurio uh, is is where we're going to realise Pinot greatness in Australia? Oh, you've stitched me up here, haven't you? I, <laughs> I'm going to pragmatically... A decline from that question I think uh, one of the inspiring things about Brian I felt was he was one of the first guys 
nipping around Piccadilly, asking apple growers. We're very Adelaide Hill centric here, but nipping at the hills of apple growers and local property owners and saying this is the future of um, Chardonnay in South Australia, et cetera, et cetera. He was well ahead of the curve on that. And to me, speaking of not sitting still, he was just always chirping and biting and trying to find the next pioneer and always found it. He was establishing um, new areas, new conquests. I moved to Tasmania. Um, it was one fleeting moment. A, I'd, I'd been at Petaluma for a long time, 97 through 08, including study. So in 2008, the great heat wave of the Adelaide Hills, when it was over 40 degrees Celsius for at least 10 to 12 days, um, the Chardonnay was dripping, almost melting off the vines. There were... Oh, um, there were picking managers cruising around to different vineyards offering pickers um, extra dollars per bucket to ship from one vineyard to the other so they could get the fruit picked and people getting into punch-ups and all sorts of stuff. And I just remember thinking, this is a cool climate, you know, uh, I'm not in a real cool climate area and I was I was very much into my cool climate, Rieslings and Chardonnays, etc. Um, and I moved to Tasmania. And Crozer came over to visit probably after six to nine months and I was working at Bay of Bites. I felt I was out of my depth at the time. I had 13 growers who I was keeping an eye on, on behalf of, you know, the Eileen Hardy Brains Trust plus Ed Carr of House of Arras. So I had all these growers and I had 29 individual site and clone Pinot Noirs to make. I was making individual, um, well, I was deducing individual batch stuff for Ed Carr. So I had this huge exposure to the north um, of Tasmania, Pipers River, Tamar Valley, the east coast, and then down south from the Huon Valley, Duan Valley, Coal Valley. Crozer comes over, tries some of the pinots, and goes, well, the true untouched terroir of Tasmania is in the northwest, so you need to get out there. And he, and he was just still saying, right, this is not touched based on air quality, soil profile, etc. In Tasmania, you should be out in the northwest. And um, again, just always moving, always thinking. And look, as far as Fleurie is concerned, I, I wouldn't have enough experience in the area. I've certainly tried his wines. I've seen them top some blind tastings um, of various quality. You know, the old the old Stonia Pinot challenges, they come up tops in blind tastings. So on occasion, so proof's in the pudding. So I, I'm not sure it's the final frontier, but far out he loves to give it a crack that's for sure if obviously you've spent plenty of time working overseas is there anywhere that if you, if you couldn't make wine in australia you had to choose and you can't sit on the fence you had to choose somewhere else to make wine in the world where would you be for oh, right now i couldn't tell you but i can give you multiple answers i remember in 2005 um, we had a beautiful exchange program with Argyle Winery in Oregon. Um, and you'll love this, Brendan. We were meant to go over to Argyle and learn about um, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir and sparkling. And I was saying, fuck that. I'm not interested in Pinot Noir. I love Riesling. I'd been bitten by Clear Valley Riesling and its transparency out of the Clear Valley. So I went over to Germany and um, worked at JL Wolf. Um, in the faults that I worked up with Ernie Lowe's and up in the Mosul as well. And again, me being privileged and given opportunities, um, Crozer had sort of helped instigate the job I was working for free. I mean, I was scrubbing floors and racking tanks, but I was in Germany and having a look at some of the finest Riesling producers in the world go about their day. Oxidative styles, um, very different to Australia and a huge inspiration for me as well. But Back then, in the OOs, it was Riesling and it would have been Germany for me all the way. Um, and then I came back and I sort of felt during my career, once I got aromatic whites out the way, maybe I could progress to red wine making of decent body. Maybe I could progress to sparkling wine making. My career sort of me trying to build confidence around certain styles and move on to the next one. So... Um, that was the 2000s when I moved to Tasmania and um, was given a two-year contract to have a look at Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Tasmania and sparkling. Then it all became about Pinot Noir. And I actually went so far as to get 
my um, parents and grandparents' birth certificates and get my British um, citizenship so I could theoretically go to Burgundy at the time and hopefully start a little mirror project between uh, Tasmania and Burgundy. Um, Jim Chatto's done a very good job of that. And then Brexit came in, which meant I couldn't do it without with my British citizenship anymore. So to answer your question, it would have been to have a look at um, Burgundy and surrounds. Um, that didn't happen. So me and my ego uh, chuffed off to Oregon for a working holiday in 2015. So by this stage, you know, there was respect for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay at the Willamette Valley. Plus I knew a heap of people from the Petaluma Argyle exchanges. I'd had Oregonians working for me at Bay of Fires as well. So in 2015, I hopped over to Oregon and I did physically make um, Pinot Noirs out of um, the AVAs, the subregions of the Willamette Valley in 2017, 18, 19. So that was then, that was in the 2010s. So in the 2020s, cliche, if you could make wine anywhere in the world, I would say Tasmania because that's where I am and that's where I'm doing it. But whoa. It's a big question. I honestly don't know. It would. I'd probably tell you somewhere that I hadn't been before. I'd love to say Hungary or Germany or France, but I've I'd sort of worked, and I, again, just being itchy and wanting to move all the time. It would be a bit of being there, done that. I'd, I'd gladly go and have, and see what Anna Martins is up to, um, <laughs> and do some Etna stuff. But honestly, the world is so diverse um and we might circle back to this later but i find it very hard to plonk myself on one vineyard in one region in one place without getting a bit twitchy and wanting to know what's happening next and where it's coming from etc so i haven't answered your question at all i've just gone off on a tangent but oh look i will say i think i will say probably germany and riesling Back to the Future in 2005. There you go. Germany. Riesling. The... I'm curious to know. Um, obviously, you're, you're... Germany. <laughs> What's sparking your curiosity at the moment? Because you're, you're a really, obviously, you're, you absorb so much information. What The story that I'm sort of picking up here is that like uh, all of your experiences so far are things that you've just been surrounded by either you're getting you're getting information in osmotically or you're just an such an amazing active listener where's the next sort of level of curiosity taking you at the moment are you looking at any particular wine style or are you looking at any particular terroir or any particular variety that you're just like damn i want to try my hand at this next uh yep i am i well last year um there was a grower in Tasmania who had their Riesling rejected by another wine company in Tasmania that will remain nameless due to botrytis. And it's not in all cases, but a lot of cases in Australia, I've found that, you know, if Riesling has botrytis, therefore it's sub-quality, substandard, unless it's an absolutely dedicated botrytis cinera type vineyard or style that people are going for. So it's either all or nothing. Um, I've spent a lot of time with Riesling trying to encourage, particularly in dry seasons, to let the botrytis ride for a little bit. And if it dries out, you can introduce some extra layers into your wines. But this vineyard had their fruit rejected and they came and asked us down at the co-op whether we needed Riesling, which we didn't at the time. Two weeks prior, we'd um, signed up to grab a little bit of extra Riesling from another vineyard and we regretfully declined. And then two weeks later, they sort of said, look, we still haven't found a home for this. And we got some photos and realized that it had des desiccated so much that we sort of said look if it's dry let's the weather's dry let's just leave it another week or two we'll come up and pick it and James Bonoski and um, some of his mates um, who were down from Sydney went up and picked it and I sort of had a look at it and it was to me the desiccation level was a sort of BA to TBA standard from on the jet the old German Riesling scale. So we picked this stuff and pressed it for three days and made this incredibly high concentrated sugar syrup of a Riesling, high Erxler, as they'd say. And we made a hundred and fifty odd gram residual 
um, dessert style Riesling. And this was me. I I didn't quite get the notebook out, but I just remember watching it happen back in 2005. And to me, I'd sort of hit this crescendo of actually having the opportunity to make a BA style Riesling, which I'd seen some 20 years ago sort of thing. So that piqued my interest. But um, Dr. Edgewise, at the moment, um, I mentioned before that you know, listening acutely to how people make wines and various styles and stuff. I'm just sort of tapping into um, sparkling at the moment. I've made sparklings for Meadowbank, who I'm partnered up with since 2016, but I've got some Dr. Edge sparklings that I've um, got on Tourage or, um, you know, sitting on leaves in bottles since 2020 through to present day, so 2020 through 24 vintage. Um and to me, I've managed to snaffle a couple of single vineyards. Um, I've snaffled a couple of organic growers um, in sparkling as well. And I've got some sort of predominantly Chardonnay, predominantly Pinot Noir, plus some blends in between that are sitting on Tourage. So that to me, uh, sparkling wine is one of the most challenging wines to make all the way from thyme and lees liqueur, getting your bead right, getting your picking right. It's multifaceted. Um, there's many, many, many things that can go wrong from primary to secondary ferment to disgorgement, etc. So if I've got the patience, I'll try and leave these sort of for the four to five to six, seven year mark, try and use very little, um, if any, expedition liqueur and start to try and go down back into single vineyard, terroir-driven wines out of Tasmania, like I did with Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays and Rieslings in the late 2010s, but but do the old sparkling thing. Get into sparkling. That's the next little little jab step for me, I think. Are you getting like a lot of, is there a sort of latent pressure being in Tasmania? There is just a big thing about Tasmanian sparkling, Tasmanian cool climate. Do you feel like there's a decent amount of pressure being applied? We're like, oh look, you know, I'm a pretty becoming a pretty well known winemaker from Tasmania, but I don't currently make large rafts of sparkling. It's not your speciality. Um, yes and no. Um, I I had made sparkling for Meadowbank. They they were an incredible vineyard which had been supplying fruit to the House of Aris Aris and various other um, producers for a while. So. I felt morally obliged in that sense to do it. Um, and I was making pet nats on the side. I think, you know, you've had a look at a couple on the show. Um, so it it really came down to, I won't say because it's Tasmania, it came down to wines that I like to drink in my mid to late 40s with my partner. Um, she likes sparkling, I like sparkling. We like white wines predominantly, not necessarily red wines at this stage. So a lot of it comes down to what I like to drink, um, accessibility to clonal stock and vineyard sources. Yes, a lot of them are probably more suited to sparkling because they're based in Tasmania or have history of being grown for sparkling. So um, I don't feel the pressure, but I, it's it's one thing I, I'd spend a lot of time disgorging and helping make the crows of sparklings. A lot of time in the vineyards helping make House of Arras um, sparklings a lot of time in the vineyard um, and making Meadowbank which is a beautiful vineyard but a partnership so selfishly um, I just wanted to make sparklings um, for myself and of a style that my partner and I like to drink and with any luck we've been pretty lucky so far making Dr. Edge wine styles that we like to drink some other people seem to like it as well so we've been pretty lucky in that regard so with any luck um, people are like the sparklings we start to spit out in the next two to five years, hopefully. But, oh, again, yeah, it's Tasmania. There's Munier, there's Chardonnay, there's Pinot. Um, it's suited to sparkling, so we better do it a little bit, just a little. You briefly just mentioned clones. A um, question I tend to like, ask a little wine makers, I'm always fascinated to hear their, their perspective on this, but... Do you think clones matter more than viticultural practice? Can you answer a sort of a, a, a mismatched clone with better viticulture? Yeah, I think, yeah, again, and 
20 years, I've heard a lot of arguments, you know, um, Joe Holliman, my friend up in the Tamar Valley, says clone has no implication on wine style whatsoever. Um, and I think if someone was to, like him, grab a bunch of sticks, bunch of Pinot Noir cuttings, throw them up into the air and randomly plant them in a Marseille fashion, then yeah, I think you would start to lose definite distinction between clones. Um, but I was taking some people through the winery the other day and where we have clones planted in separate rows and separate vineyards in Tasmania, there's undeniable difference between clones within the one block. Um, when they mature, how they ripen, um, and I dare say that there is a distinct difference. Um, I've seen a lot of, being in Tasmania for 15 years, you see because Pinot Noir has become so lauded, you see a lot of people in with sparkling clones of Pinot Noir try and convert it to table, and it's a bit of a mishit and a bit of a mismatch, and then um, farming has changed and farming is shaped to try and help with yield or exposure and these sorts of things to turn it into a table block, and I've seen some of the better Pinot Noirs um, out of Tasmania made from dedicated sparkling clones. So... Yes, farming is the be-all and end-all, and farming will always reign supreme when it comes to quality of fruit, no matter what the clone is. But there is definitely a difference between them when you look at bunch size and, um, you know, how some of them are expressed. Um, yeah, I don't even know if that answered your question, but there's a difference. But I think if you farm them right and you farm them well, um, they'll come on. They'll come in line pretty soon how do you manage obviously you've got um uh, between dr edge your own staff meadowbank a bunch of other projects you're involved with the cooperative that you run um a family as well then you've got to worry about sales for your own wine brand yeah. as well as dressing up uh every now and then and flashing the most fun, amazing fun photos on say. instagram <laughs> having having fun <laughs> How do you how do you manage like all of that? Is it just go go go? Are you one of those people that just? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if you don't drink cu coffee, for example, and you're just one of those people that drink tea and just continually goes and goes and goes. Is that true? No, I drink heaps of coffee. I shouldn't, um, but I, I don't know how it's came come to be. Um, again, I, I think it's manifested from when I started. I had an opportunity to run with it, and I was taught that you know. Work, hard work prevails and I got taught how to work hard in a winery from an early age and it just snowballed. Um, again, I, I mentioned I came from a bit of a sporting background, so there's a bit of white wine fever, not not being competitive, but needing to learn and try and evolve and move as much as you can. I've often described this, uh, getting into Dr. Edge, um, and Meadowbank preceded that. And I asked for a little bit of fruit for Dr. Edge and they said, oh, do you want a partner in the brand? And Mike and Joe and I have been making Brian um, for a while then. I have a lot of trouble saying no to people. That's one of one of these things. But um, I've often described it as I consider my projects and how I serendipitously fall into all these projects. It's sort of like Game of Thrones, you know, that the... the the storyline's getting so complex and I'm starting to waver a little. I don't actually know how I'm going to write myself out of it. If you know the George R. R. Martin background, he built this beautiful, complex story and then just how the fuck am I going to write myself out of it? And some days at the moment, particularly with three children at seven years and under, um, plus 20 clients out of a cooperative in Tasmania, I honestly don't know how I balance it all. Um, I had Sarah Ahmed um, from World of Fine Wine sort of um, ask me. She came and visited in 2016. We were just starting Meadowbank, I think, or 17. And she said, oh, what have you been up to in the last four or five years? And I wrote this. I started writing back and turned into this essay of all these things and tasks and Oregon for a while and then this happened and then this. And I sort of said to my beautiful partner Ella I just said fucking hell I 
I this is ridiculous. I sound like a crazy person writing with all these ideas and this manic style of you know wine making career that's trying to cover off on all these bases. And she goes, "Yeah, yeah, it seemed pretty <laughs> manic." And I just said, "I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for all of this." Um, but she helps me. She's she helps me a lot with Meadowbank and the socials and she actually helps me cook books and keep our finances under control for all of our clients and all those sorts of things. Um, at the moment, yeah, I don't know how I balance it. I quite often um, want to ask you the same question as well. Brennan, having seen your career and you drifting off into distillation and various other drink styles because it's not all about wine, wine, you know, monoculture, etc. I often ask myself, um, the same thing. I don't know how you do it either. And now you've got family involved as well. Um, the short answer is I don't know, but I pr should probably start saying no to the odd project every now and then. That'll probably help. I think. Drink less coffee, get some uh, sleep. I... <laughs> well, you got to look after sleep. I mean, it's 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 a marathon, uh, isn't it? But I think there are, there are some people that just like doing stuff and there are some people that just want to want to chill and and you know take it at a different pace i think the more that you start saying no to stuff you'll realize that you've got spare time and you'll end up plugging plugging that time with other stuff that you're choosing to be a part of anyway so i'm i'm not a massive believer in in the word no as a means to an end more so as a the word no as a means to say yes to more important things yeah i, I i'm very mindful of um you know spreading spreading myself too thinly across winemaking styles or brands or for clients, etc. So I like to think that just I'm just still under enough control to be able to put my hand on my heart and say, well, I put everything I could into this client's wine or into my Dr. Ed Chardonnay, or I put as much mediocre um, customer-based preference into this shard on we and be happy with the products you know so <laughs> so look I, I must say i will eventually there will become a time when um my priority is still very much with my family um and i spend i believe i spend more time with my kids and my family than say the average uh, nine to five business person. I've got flexible hours and I run around, so it's a bit discombobulated for the kids, but I still believe I spend a bit more time with them outside of harvest. Um, so, so far, so good. But when that starts to really become threatened, I think that's when I'll start to try and close down or at least uh, streamline a few projects and then try and, try and stay around home base and uh, Tasmania base a little bit more. There's also health. Have your kids as well? Have your kids taught you any lessons? Whoa. They have. I think. I think the the key lesson your children teach you is you know you love if you're full of joy and you love what you do you love your job you love your friends you love your partner um, you think you know love and then one of these little things starts to. Um, come into your life, let alone three, and you just have this um, incredible sense of wonder and inspiration on a daily basis, and you're just full of joy and full of love. Um, they give you the shits, and sometimes you want to throttle them, not in real life, but um, it's just another elevation of joy. And again, it, it, it that level of joy forces you to reflect on what you're doing, um, how important is wine really at the end of the day? You're, you're making luxury products for people. So how important is that when it comes to your family and your children and your friends and people, people you like? So um, they've taught me that. They've taught me to prioritize a little bit and um, maybe just think about doing one less trip, one less trip to the States or to purse or you know because the first thing as soon as you get on the plane for me at least these days as soon as you get on the plane you're sort of already looking forward to coming home and um having a wrestle with a little one yeah
it seems like you know how you've got you've got them. the same sort of childlike wonder. Oh well, yeah, I mean the chi- the the thing for me was this. Uh, when Shelby came along was the the renewal of this concept of childlike wonder where it's just constant curiosity um, you know wanting to to absorb all the information afresh again um, you know for um, potential ignorance that had grown uh, I guess over over a course of like a number of years um, it was best sort of put to us in another conversation when your when your self-talk goes from um, no no I don't really want to do that to, oh, I'm too old. I can't do that. That can be yeah. kind of really kind of like that, this triggering aspect where you're like, wow, there are things now that simply because of my age, I will never get to enjoy or never get to do. Sometimes a lot of those times you're choosing not to do that. You just got to go out and do it again um, and, and keep trying. Do you, you see, obviously you get, um, you know, so much inspiration from the people that you work with. You've mentioned all the amazing growers, the amazing partners you have in different projects, um, all the mentors that you've had to either um, you know express or not. Do you draw any inspiration outside of the wine industry at all? Like, do you do? Is it books, music? Uh, most typically, or are you just one hundred percent dedicated and obsessive? Oh, uh, look, a lot of people meet me and. Um, I don't obsessively collect wine anymore. I'm not after the great wines of the world, the Burgundies and the Champagnes and the Bordeaux and those sorts of things. I, again, I feel like I've had a privileged enough upbringing that I've drunk enough fancy wine for, for 10 people. Um, so I seek a lot of inspiration from um, the outdoors. I love to exercise. I love to catch up with old Adelaide mates and mountain bike and hike and do all the things we used to do very often, more often than we realized um, was possible, at least these days. So I do a lot of that. I um, I would consider myself, I'm not a musician, I was never a trained musician, but I'd consider my um, passion for music probably as strong as it is for wine um, as well. And I find it very hard to get through a day um, without listening to something new or oh, some of the, the golden era music that I used to like at the winery or at home or introducing my kids to it. My partner's um, quite an accomplished musician and she's teaching the kids piano and these sorts of things. And nothing brings me joy more than seeing my seven-year-old daughter sort of, you know, hash out um, jingle bells or something like that, having never been able to do it myself. So short answer is I I love what I do and I love making wine and I put a lot of effort into it, but I really try and consider the fact that there are other things other than wine. And as mentioned, I don't come from a multi-generational wine company and you can see it all over the branding um, that I have for my wines and all those sorts of things. It's all music related. Um, there's no you know, deep political history within our family or anything. So I, I got into wine. I was in a winery. I liked music. Um, a lot of my brand and labels are all inspired by the music I listened to in the winery, in the cellars in the 1990s when, as mentioned, I was in a pretty low point in my life and I felt like I was being dragged out and into the real world after a pretty horrible accident. So that's where the Dr. Edge sort of, artwork and these sorts of things came from and it was just a simple guy who <laughs> pretty simple um, guy who likes music and that's about as deep or as complex as my life is and i like pop culture and squishing grapes and i was lucky enough to get a good job somewhere so i rolled with it and that's where we are but no kids outdoors exercise um i listen to abc news on the radio that's where I try and get most of my world affairs, but um, nothing much deeper than that, really. I spent a couple of years working for Steve Panel when I was oh, yeah. cutting my teeth, and I watched him basically hurl a iPod across the winery because uh, someone, me, was playing. Uh, it was on shuffle. I wasn't playing it, but it started playing Phil Collins, and apparently. Apparently, Phil Collins is bad for wine. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
What, Phil Collins solo or Phil Collins Genesis? Or both? Or just We're talking Phil uh, from memory because it's been etched almost like PTSD. Uh, it was Genesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's good. <laughs> I, I've, what? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I, um, I used to. What music do you listen to in the winery? What is the, the music you kind of go for? Oh, uh, it started um, again in the 90s when I got into the wine industry. Um, I was, you know, cis white male in Adelaide. So obviously I loved American hip hop, gangster style, the harder the better, because that's what we did. Ugh, terrible. But um, again, with the moody, moody nature of rehabilitation and working my way into the wine industry, I listened to a lot of, um, not necessarily hip hop, but trip hop, which was uh, um, a sort of moody, dark genre and style that was coming out at the time, like uh, Massive Attack and Porter's Head and the Beastie Boys were bringing out a heap of instrumental works and I could sort of do away with the, the vicious rapping in some songs and just had beautiful melodic uh, music playing and that has a lot, again a lot to do with the artwork and art album covers that I have on my wine labels but that's what I was into at the time and then hey suddenly you realise that a lot of these hip hop instrumentals and a lot of the samples and breaks come from some classic soul and jazz um, and beautiful styles of music from all over the world and so I'll blame hip hop or trip hop, but then that just you you go down the rabbit hole and you start to discover French quartets from the seventies that you never would have heard of, who are absolutely beautiful. But there's a three second grab that MF Doom used in two thousand, and suddenly you know this music. So cortex, by the way, if we geeks out there, but um, yeah, that's uh. That's I listen to all styles of music. I'd like to say I don't listen to um, country and western. I don't listen to a lot of it, but that's actually a pretty good, pretty good genre too. And we had some musicians um, who are winemakers who work at our winery as well. So it's open play for it. Music's very important to I think um, the vibe and morale in a winery, particularly when everyone's tired at the end of harvest, etc. So music's very important to me. I used to tell a few stories. SC Pinnell would appreciate it. I used to think that Pinot Noir ferments at Bay of Fires responded well to hip hop, and I would have this superstition that some decent hip hop would actually cause none of them to stick or to become volatile or, you know, have off. So I was convinced that music helped yeast actually dry out a lot of the ferments and, you know, help me present these wines to the bosses. So nuts. But anyway, music's important. Phil Collins, not so much. All right. Maybe not so much. i got to ask, though, so young winemakers, a lot of, um, I'm not sure if you've ever been in this sort of position. It recently happened to me because I don't consider myself an old winemaker. I don't consider myself a successful winemaker. Um, you know, but it doesn't stop winemaking students coming up to me and asking advice. Uh, if you had to give advice to a budding young winemaker, what would you tell them? Oh, you just got to listen. I spend more time listening maybe than talking. God, I sound like an old man just saying it, you know, but um, I honestly think, uh, you know, I spent a lot of wine dinners and a lot of wine um, shows um, watching people argue one point of view till, you know, till death almost in end. I really felt I had so much to learn if I was polite, courteous, listened, asked, weighted questions rather than try and dominate or show intelligence by suddenly blurting out all these ideas and these sorts of things. So um, I would say to um, young winemakers, there's a lot of winemakers who they may be working for who've been around for a long time, and you do, you see a lot of things and a lot of different styles and grapes and farms and things like that. And winemaking comes down to choices. Um, some of them are right, some of them are wrong, and you just need to come to peace with it and keep moving on and, and, and keep going. But I, I have learned, I suggest I would have learned the most uh, and I've gained the most confidence in my ability or the cho- choices I make when it comes to winemaking, having listened to a number of people 
and worked at a number of wineries and worked as hard as I can to gain the exposure to see how wines turn out when something fucks up or how they turn out when you have a perfect season, you don't have to touch the thing and then suddenly this, you know, seamless wine comes out of it. So yeah, it's, it's really just listen, learn, work hard. Um, as I'd say in basketball, the fundamentals, just work on your fundamentals and just try and work hard, listen and respect, um, people's opinions as well you know and it's like these days the last 10 15 years the dogmatic approach to natties or the dogmatic approach to conventional wines um why can't we all just get along i think there's answers for everyone and there's styles that can embrace both of those phenomenon so just be polite and courteous and listen and i don't know if this happened to you brendan but Oh, you know, you're sitting there at a winery. It's your first sort of assistant winemaker um, position and something goes wrong at two o'clock in the morning and you're freaking out and then you manage to resolve the problem. I literally sat there and thought, holy shit, I do know stuff. And you get, you get, just sort of seems to happen. You, you think I'm like you, I never presumed to be very good or professional. And then something goes wrong and you sort of spend a minute trying to work your way through the problem. And we all know winemaking is a piece of piss until something goes wrong and you need to preemptively strike and try and head that disaster off at the curb before it becomes too big of a problem. And again, the best way to do that is sort of sit and watch and listen as things go wrong and things go right and just try and remember it for when you need it 10 to 15 years down the track. The amount of times that I've actually relied on on stuff from ten years ago is incredible. It's like, oh, this one's rearing its ugly head now. That's 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 uh, that's novel. I haven't seen that for a while. Yeah, that's right. Oh, this you know, you sound like Grandpa Simpson. This reminds me of two thousand eight when it was a very hot vintage and we had to get it in real quick. And I had a piece of toast for breakfast. <laughs> but you do, you end up turning into one of those um, <laughs> people when you remember vintages and moments and it does it does help i had one of my employees call me the dinosaur a couple of years ago and fuck i took it to heart i was mortified because i was he had mentioned that, oh you're giving me lots of pearls of wisdom and i was giving him some advice on fermentation and how he could potentially make his wine he had some grapes and it's like well you could go this way this way this way this way and he goes oh geez you know you know a lot you're a bit of an old industry dinosaur aren't you and I took it very personally. So I think within nine to 12 months, I had um, made a wine, a table style Pinot Munier, and called it Tyrannosaurus Dredge and put a dinosaur on the front label and sent it down the <laughs> bottling line and said, fuck you. This cool, funky label said, fuck you with your, you know, dinosaur of the industry. And he said, oh, I don't even remember calling you that. Did I call you that? Oh, I'm sorry. It's like, whoa. Oh. I took offence and suddenly I've got a wine with a dinosaur in it. But anyway, where were we? <laughs> well, if what if we flipped it around? So you're no longer giving advice to a budding young winemaker, but now you're CEO of Wine Australia. What are you? What are the first oh, three things well, that you're doing you if you're starting this tomorrow? <laughs> Most oh, people don't like answering this one. We, I hate it, and I purposefully didn't really look into it so I could give an honest answer. And I don't really have one. I think, you know, an old friend who I worked with coming through the ranks was Rachel Triggs. So I'd probably say re-employ Rachel Triggs at any cost. Um, but uh, when I think about Wine Australia, uh, I think about, again, a lot of those arguments that I heard during uh, my stint judging in the wine show system. You'd have a winemaker from a very large um, corporate um, arguing with a winemaker who makes 200 cases per annum. And I always found those sort of arguments about the styles of wine that should be hitting the market and they'd almost fight to the death. And I just sort of think, you know, you're in different spheres. You're in the 200 case per year hand cell realm and you're in the multi hundreds of thousands of cases um, making, in some instances, wines for people who don't really want to think about it. They are economizing routine and so you want to just have a glass of wine at the end of the day like you and I want to have a two is extra dry and not think about it. 
So if I was um, CEO of Wine Australia, I would be probably trying to um, concentrate on those aspects of the industry all the way from the 200 case per annum winemaker all the way through to the multinational corporation as best I can. Because all the arguments you hear these days from the small producers are oh, bloody wine Australia. They don't spend enough time on the small growers, the small producers and all those sorts of things. But you have to respect the fact that there's not a lot of revenue raising on a national level from 200 case per annum producers. So maybe the lion's share of attention and funding does need to go to the larger companies. But then the smaller producers say, oh, you know, they just make making generic dross and uh, and that's not how Australia should be represented. So uh, it's 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 a hard one. If I was CEO of Wine Australia, I'd just be trying to best reflect Australia and try and please everyone as best I could. That's all I could hope for because with such a large industry with very passionate, diverse winemakers, viticulturists, it's impossible to impossible to please everyone i'd as ceo i'd probably sit on a fence somewhere like switzerland and just eat chocolate and try and temper the room as best i could i think i i find the whole thing so again i'm a simpleton and likes music and just makes wine so i find the whole microcosm of australian wine so complex i'd find it really hard to try and appease Arguably, the revenue raises in large-scale wineries compared to the small boutique producers like ourselves who think, who feel we truly reflect the Australian wine style and how it should be. Um, again, I've just ploughed you with the words and not given you a specific answer because I just don't know. I think. Well, that's the hard thing, isn't it? Because it's an it's it's almost an impossible um, situation that they're in. Um, yeah, you know, and Australian exactly. wine is currently going under you know quite large cultural shifts uh and you're right you know there, there are plenty of small producers that say that you know well, this is the australian style this is what we're making but i've always been quite vexed at that whole concept because um for the vast majority uh, of wines that we try from australia it's very hard to be able to say this is uniquely australian you yeah. know in your sort of view do you consider what a truly great wine is is, is as like a mimic of of established wine style from the old world or is there this concept is there this thing that could exist on the tip of our tongues you know that is uniquely australian that no one else can is, is australian terroir real you know uh, i think so if as a scientist if you took a wine and made it the same way from different areas all over the world you would find terroir specific wines for sure and you know too often the winemaker gets involved and has these new styles and Sometimes, you know, it's an old cliche, but if you use a hell of a lot of new oak from a forest in France, then are you expressing the terroir of Australia? I'd argue no. Um, but I, again, I try and humble myself and know that anything I do in a winery with grapes and wine, someone's already thought of already or someone's implemented this technique. Um, so I'm very much happy to... Uh, try and reflect Australian wine as a style um, that has sort of come about from oh, generations of winemaking and whether it's Europe or Australia, I, I think vineyard and farming um, surpasses all. And I think there is an Australian terroir and I think there are Chardonnays or Pinots or what have you that are very specific and very much have a sense of place from Tasmania, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd never sit there and, and say that an introduced species of grape that has suddenly appeared in the Coal River Valley is now suddenly what Australia should be and should be represented by. I, again, I just, it's a luxury good and often I just can't take it that seriously. But um, I think... You know, the most fun I've had, and quite often we're not taken seriously, whether it's just me because of my dress-ups and all those sorts of things, but we're always going to be Australian and, you know, for the vast majority or for a long time, we're probably not going to be taken that seriously because we are the Aussie bloody larrikin and all this sort of stuff. So 
why not roll with it? I tend to roll with it and try and have fun and acknowledge that we're not curing cancer. It's just wine. So let's have some fun with it. And the, the greatest triumph I have is when you surprise the nitpickers or the people who want to, who want to cut you down and you um, sort of help them out with some pretty epic wines. That's the most satisfying thing for me. And I think um, we as Australians, I think we need to, um, you know, band together and maybe embrace our, our larrikinism a little bit, but also, you know, respect the land from, you know, where we come from. You know, grapes have only been around for, you know, where I'm headed with this, but grapes have only been around for a very short period of time. So, or oh, terroir and typical Australia, oh, I don't know. Hands off. <laughs> well, mate, we have been chatting for over an hour. Have we? And I reckon, oh, yeah, and I reckon that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic spot to leave it. Uh, to be honest, because I think that's very poignant. <laughs> Is there anything in particular? Because oh, how know, these what things we... usually work uh, for those who are like, <laughs> for those playing at home, uh, I usually send through a page worth of questions, and I reckon uh, Peter, you're the, the only one that's actually kind of printed them out and done like actual answers to them. But we never really get through them because there's so many different side questions and whatnot. But is there any any ones that you were itching to answer? Any... <laughs> Let me check. Mm, make great wine and so you've good. done a, a remarkable a remarkable job at actually touching on almost every single thing. We almost got there, didn't we? I think, um, yeah, we got. Yeah, no, I don't mimic the greatest wines of the world. I think that's an error to try and do that. We touched on that, you know. You're never going to do something that someone else hasn't for the most part. So I don't think we need to mimic great wines of the world. We need to aspire to some of them, maybe. But again, oh, look, man, I think we're, we're pretty right in here. We didn't talk a hell of a lot about the wine show judging system and its relevance today, but I'm going to fucking leave that one right alone as well mm. <laughs> they see more for the winemakers than they do for the people yeah maybe <laughs> yeah it was there's always an interesting disconnect between the wines and the consumer i found with the wine show judging system and i've I judged in a lot of we've judged in a lot of different styles of show that really try to bridge the gap and um they have a place definitely and i learned a lot um by being involved but yeah it's just um yeah getting that message to the consumer it's always always the hardest part um mm. now i think we've covered most of it haven't we mate it has been a pleasure chatting to yeah. you dude nice chatting to you as well i sort of felt like we were just sitting at the pub somewhere having a beer but I don't know how relevant that was to any of the wines I make or their styles or anything, but it turned into more of a reflection of life and being a parent and all those oh, nice you, things, Honestly, but... mate, you, sh you should see on the Discord group, the uh, we've got, uh, so basically, I'm not sure if you've heard of Discord before. Hmm. Uh, it's uh, basically like a big chat room. Um uh, we've got about 700 or so members at the moment. And these are the, the most hardcore dedicated fans of the channel. Uh, oh, and the sure amount that your bottles... Oh, dude, it's wild. It's wild. So they are searching for your bottles overseas and they are posting up photos. Um, I'll send you through some screenshots. It's incredible. You're probably one of the most collected wines. Off the, the, the fact that you actually have quite a broad distribution, like where are your wines sold? At the moment, globally, uh, do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, currently a little bit in Southeast Asia, um, British Columbia, uh, the US, UK. Um, that's about it. Yeah, USA, UK, Southeast Asia. And again, this is all serendipity. People say, oh, can we bring your wines over? It's like, yeah, sure. And then we work it out. But... Um, yeah, there's a few around. I'm working on it. If you're a budding entrepreneurial importer and you didn't hear that country on the list, then uh, that country doesn't have Dr. Edge and probably should. So get in touch. We can link you up. <laughs> yeah, get on my website. I don't say no to anyone. <laughs>